Hello, everybody. For the past several weeks here at Saddleback, I've been teaching through uh, the book of Daniel, and we're calling the series Unshakable, which is um, about how do you thrive no matter what they throw at you in life. And we're looking at how Daniel, as a young 15-year-old prisoner of war, was taken to um, Babylon, and uh, by the end of his life, 85, 80, at 85 years of age, 70 years later, he becomes the second most powerful man in the entire kingdom. And it's an amazing story of how do you keep your integrity and how do you keep your faith uh, in a culture that is increasingly anti everything you believe. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this week at Saddleback, we are celebrating the 25th, as you know, uh, anniversary of Celebrate Recovery, which started as a simple ministry of the church and uh, now, of course, is a, is a global movement. Uh, literally tens of thousands of churches have used Celebrate Recovery. It is a, uh, a program that's used as the official recovery program in about 47 state prison systems. It's used around the world. It's used in Russia and many, many other countries. Uh, and I want to just pause and I want us to look at why has God blessed Celebrate Recovery? I think it's important for everybody to know this. It's a signature issue of this church, Saddleback Church. And uh, what I want to do today is kind of share with you the underpinnings of why recovery is important. And it's so important that I want everybody to understand this. And I'm going to give you eight uh, values or eight principles. Or this, you could have titled this, Eight Things I've Learned About Human Behavior uh, in now uh, over 40 years of ministry. Eight things I've learned about Celebrate Recovery. So if you take out your uh, notes, your message notes, let's get right, right into this. The first thing that I've learned, and I deeply believe this with all of my heart, is this. Everybody needs recovery from something. Everybody needs recovery from something. There are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who know they need recovery and those who haven't got there yet and don't, you know, are still in that river in Egypt, denial. Um, and so everybody needs recovery from something. Now, why is that? Because everybody's broken. Okay, everybody's broken. And let me just show you three verses uh, on this message uh, outline. Uh, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Okay, who does that include? Yeah, all. Okay. I looked up this word, the Greek word for all in, in the Greek New Testament, in the Bible. And the word here in Greek means all. <laughs> it means you, me, the Pope, the President, everybody, all. A-L-L. -L. Nobody's not included. Uh, everybody's included and nobody's not included. All have sinned. We can just stop with that one right there. But look at these other two verses. Isaiah 53, 6. Uh, all of us have strayed away like sheep. We've wandered off God's path to go our own way and do our own thing. Everybody's done their own thing. We've wandered away from God. Now, the result of that is the next verse, Isaiah 59, verse 2. So, there's a problem. Your sins have cut you off from God. Have you ever been praying and felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling? Yeah. Have you ever prayed and talked to God and felt like God was a million miles away. Well, guess who moved? <laughs> God didn't move away from you. The Bible says your sins have cut you off from God. Now this estrangement from God causes every other single problem in your life. Relational problems, financial problems, uh, sexual problems, uh, mental problems, physical problems. Uh, because of this estrangement from God, everything is broken. The weather is broken, the economy is broken, uh, politics is broken, uh, uh, history is broken. Have you noticed your body doesn't work perfectly? <laughs> Anybody want to give a testimony on that one? Yeah, okay. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's all broken. But today, I want us to just focus on one big problem that it causes, and it's this. You might write this down, number two. My disconnect from God blurs my birthrights. I'm gonna explain this to you. My disconnect from God blurs my birthrights. Because we're not in harmony with our creator, 
It causes so much confusion about the most fundamental issues of your life. And uh, there are four fundamental issues of your life that you're all con always confused about when you're out of whack with God, when you're out of fellowship with God, when you're disconnected from God. And the first one, you might write this down, is uh, my identity. Who am I? That's my identity. The reason why everybody's asking this question today and the whole world's having an identity crisis. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I really? Because we're disconnected from God. It's, it's cut us off from God. Who am I is the question of identity. The next question that everybody asks is, where did I come from and who do I belong to? That's called my heredity. My heredity. So you've got my identity and my heredity. Who am I? Where did I come from and who do I belong to? The third big question, and I hear all of these questions over and over and over, that's why I wrote the book Purpose Driven Life, is that, does my life matter and have purpose? And that is the question of dignity. Dignity. When you don't know who you are, where you came from, who you belong to, uh, what's your purpose, does your life have any meaning, you lack dignity. You lack significance, you lack meaning, you lack purpose in your life. So we've got identity, heredity, dignity. And then the fourth question that is confusing to everybody is this one, where am I headed? And that's my destiny, my destiny. Now we see the evidence of confusion in these four areas everywhere. People confused about their identity, their heredity, their dignity, and their destiny. These four things, your identity, your heredity, your uh, destiny, and your dignity are called your birthrights in the Bible. Your, your birthrights, that's what they're called. Uh, and your birthrights include your identity, your heredity, your dignity, and your destiny. And if you don't know your birthright, then you can't answer these questions. Now number three, third thing I want you to understand. I have two birthrights. One of them's natural and the other is supernatural. You have a natural birthright which you get from your parents, and you have a spiritual birthright, which you get from God. You got your natural birthright when you were born. You get your spiritual birthright when you're born again. The first is a physical, the second is a spiritual. Uh, the first birthright, your, your physical birthright, your natural birthright, is for earth. It it's really only applies here on earth. Uh, but your spiritual birthright, applies for eternity, earth and eternity. Parents, God, born, born again, physical, spiritual. Now, your natural birthright uh, comes from your DNA. And the DNA that you were given your parents, whether you even know your parents or not, is really irrelevant. Why did God choose your parents? Why did God choose, you said, why didn't God give me better parents? Some of you didn't even know your parents. Some of you had an absentee parent. Some of you had an abusive parent. I'm sorry, I really am. God chose your parents to be your parents, not because of their parenting skill, but God chose your parents, listen very closely, out of love. He chose your parents because they had just the right DNA to create you, and he was far more interested in making you than he was their parenting skills. Does that make sense? So God wanted you alive. You are not an accident. You are not an accident. There are accidental parents. There are no accidental children. <laughs> there are illegitimate parents. There are no illegitimate children. Your parents may not have planned you, but God did. He wanted you alive. And so you are to honor your parents, even if they were not very good parents or you never even knew them. You're to honor them simply because they had the DNA that in that particular mixture would create you. And if they hadn't gotten together, you wouldn't exist and God wanted you alive. So God is much bigger than the character or the personality of your parents. Does that make sense? God was more interested in you. He loves you when you were born. So both of these birthrights, your natural and your spiritual, your natural and your supernatural, they're both extremely important. From your parents, you got your physical birthright, which means God decided um, what was gonna be your gender. You're either male or female, or what, what's your race. He determined your physical characteristics. Uh, he had determined your talents. 
He determined uh, your nationality because of where they were going to be born and where you would be born. Uh, and there are many, many characteristics that have to do with your physical birthright. Now, in some cultures, uh, firstborn sons have an advantage. This happens in you know, Eastern uh, countries and Middle Eastern countries. Certainly in, in the Jewish culture, firstborn son received a special birthright. Uh, and they got all kinds of th additional values if they were the firstborn. Uh, by the way, I was not the firstborn. How many of you were not the firstborn? All right. Uh, how, many, how many of you are glad that your parent didn't say after they had the first kid, uh, let, we got the one quality child, let's just stop here and focus on quality, not quantity. Okay, you wouldn't be alive. So when a church says we want quality, not quantity, they're going, the rest of the world can go to hell, is what they're saying. That's what they're saying. No, we want both. When you go fishing, you want to catch the most fish or the biggest? I want both. Okay. I, 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 in my church, I want quality and quantity. I want to catch the most fish I can, and I want them to grow as deep and as big in Christ as they can possibly be. So I, I want both. Now. Um, so is, in some cultures, if you're the firstborn in the birthright, it means the wealth is being passed on to you, um, the authority, the influence, the inheritance. For instance, in the United Kingdom right now, uh, Prince William will become the King of England one day, not Prince Harry, because William was born first. So that's, that's an advantage of a physical birthright. Uh, most of us were not firstborn uh, sons, but uh, some of you are, and goody for you. Okay. <laughs> Now, now, what I really want to focus on uh, in, in this message is the second birthright and its relationship to your future, your identity, your, your uh, heredity, your dignity, and your, your destiny. Um, and the reason I want to focus on this is because it's the least understood, your spiritual birthright, the birthright you got when you were born again. Now, the first thing we learned about it in these verses here I've put on your outline is that our spiritual birthrights come from believing and receiving Christ. That's how you get your spiritual birthright, from believing and receiving Christ. John 1, 12 and 13. Uh, to all who received him, who believed in his name, Jesus gave the right to become children of God. Now, I want you to circle the right. That's a birthright. Those who believe in Christ, who receive him, Jesus gives the right, that's a birthright, to become children of God. Everybody in the world is loved by God, everybody in the world is created by God, but not everybody in the world is a child of God. They're all loved by God, he has a purpose for their lives, he wants them to be a child of God, but a child of God uh, is a choice when you believe and you receive. Jesus gives the right to become children of God. These children are not born of natural heritage, or human decision or desire, this rebirth comes from God. Okay, number, the second verse says that your rights as a child of God uh, from being born again are eternal. They're eternal. Now, the, the birthright you get from your parents, it only lasts as long as you're on this planet. But this birthright lasts for eternity. Psalm 37, 18. The lives of the just are in God's care. Their birthright will endure forever. Circle that last phrase, forever. So this birthright's important because it's gonna last for trillions and trillions and trillions of years. The next verse, 1 Peter 1, 4 tells us that your rights as a child of God are protected in heaven. We believe in protecting people's rights. Well, God protects your spiritual rights in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 4. God has reserved a priceless inheritance for his children. It's kept for you in heaven kept in, in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And, and decay. Now, by the way, another word for birthright is inheritance. And if you want to do additional study on this, study the word heir, H-E-I-R, or uh, inheritance uh, in the New Testament to find out what your spiritual birthright is. Many, many verses in the Bible that tell us what you're going to inherit in heaven. But it's not just in heaven. Your birthright from God is not just in heaven. Your spiritual birthright is all of the benefits you get here on earth. In fact, this week I went through the New Testament and I made a list of over 180 benefits that God gives to you the moment you're born again, that nobody else gets until they're born again. 
180 different benefits. They're all a part of your birthright, your spiritual heritage. And uh, I made that list that when you become a part of God's family, uh, you get all of these things. Ephesians 1, 3 says this. Um, For in our union with Christ, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing. Circle the word every. Every spiritual blessing from heaven. And what I'm saying here is that the Bible teaches your birthright includes everything God does for you because of the cross. Everything answers prayers, uh, protects you, uh, comforts you, takes you to heaven, saves you. All of the many different things that God does because of Jesus Christ. Now, I could give you literally 180 examples, but let me just give you one. Um, How do I put this? You know, um, coming backstage here to get to see me backstage between the services, pretty difficult to do. Probably isn't going to happen. Because I'm usually back there uh, resting, uh, praying, uh, talking with other staff about issues, reformatting what I'm going to cut from the sermon because it went too long, and (laughs) many, many other things like that. Uh, And so you're probably not going to get back to see me between the service. But there are five little people who can walk past every guard and security agent in this church. And they don't even even have to worry about it. And they can just walk straight in and they have instant access uh, uh, to me um, because they're called my grandkids. (laughs) All right. And when they walk backstage, they're not paying any attention to any security guard or any door that's locked. They're just walking straight through. Uh, They have direct and uh, uh, unequivocal uh, 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 access to me because to them I'm not Pastor Rick Warren I'm Papa okay so I'm Papa so they can, they can get direct access to me and that's one of the benefits of being in my family you have a heavenly father who because of what Jesus did for you have given you direct access to him okay You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a saint. You don't have to go through anybody else. You can go directly to Jesus in Jesus' name. You have direct. That's part of your birthright. Does that make sense? And there are about 180 of those benefits that God has given to you. And God has given us the assurance that every one of those things in your spiritual birthright are going to happen. And and as a guarantee, as an assurance, he has given us his spirit. Look at the next verse, Ephesians 1:14. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it in, in heaven. So he said, this is a little guarantee that everything I've promised you is going to happen. So everybody needs recovery uh, because my disconnect from God confuses and, and blurs my, my birthright. In identity, heredity, dignity, destiny. I have two different birthrights, physical and and natural and supernatural. Uh, The fourth thing I want to point out is this. And I'm trying to summarize the whole Bible in about eight statements here. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Uh, Number four, Satan wants to keep me from enjoying my birthrights. Satan wants to keep me from enjoying my birthrights. What Satan wants to do is he wants to confuse your identity. He wants to steal your heredity, what's rightfully yours in Christ. He wants to destroy your dignity by causing you to miss your purpose. And he wants to prevent your destiny. Jesus called Satan a thief. Jesus called Satan a thief. In fact, in John 10, 10, Jesus said this. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I came to give life, life in all its fullness. Now friends, don't be fooled. Satan wants nothing good for your life. He, He may offer you kind of things, some money, pleasure, fame, fortune, whatever. Satan wants nothing good for your life. He came to steal, to kill and destroy your God-given birthrights. On the other hand, Jesus came to help you enjoy your God-given birthrights to the fullest. 
life in the fullest. Now, number five, the two tools that Satan uses, the two tools that Satan uses to steal my birthrights, and this is where we have to get into recovery here, are these, avoiding pain and short-term pleasure. Avoiding pain and settling for short-term pleasure. Those are the two, two tools that Satan uses over and over and over and over and over in your life to uh, rob your dignity, uh, steal your heredity, confuse your identity, uh, prevent your destiny. He wants to confuse your identity, steal your heredity, destroy your dignity, prevent your destiny. He came to steal and kill and destroy. Um, and, and how does he do this? Through avoiding pain and through short-term pleasure. So much, let's talk about both these. So much of our self-defeating problems, you know, the ones we bring on ourselves, all the behavior that causes us all kinds of problems in relationship, is because we're trying to avoid pain. We, we want to avoid it. We want to mask it. Um, we want to, um, we want to self-medicate it, the pain in our lives. Uh, what we don't want to do is identify it and do surgery on it. What we want to do is put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, we, we, when, when we're in pain, we don't say, we don't stop and go, oh, what's the pain caused by? We just say, stop the pain. And if I can avoid it, if I can mask it, if I can pretend it's not there, if I can deny it, if I can medicate it in, in, in different ways, uh, and by the way, the world just keeps inventing new ways to put a Band-Aid on your pain. Uh, today, I, I just made a list of the Band-Aids that the world offers to you. These are just distractions from A to Z. Alcohol, betrayal, collecting. I'm, I'm into collecting stuff. Uh, drugs, entertainment, Facebook, <laughs> okay, gambling. I'm just going A to Z here. Gambling, hobbies, illicit relationships. These are ways we medicate our pain. Junk food, killing time, uh, we, we, we loving kinds of relationships that, that mess us all up. Uh, making more money is the way we try to mask it. Uh, neediness, obsessions, uh, uh, um, pornography, quaaludes. I had to have a cue. <laughs> had to have a cue. Okay, okay. Had to have a cue. Quaaludes. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to. I want to thank Johnny Baker for that one because I was stumped. So yeah, all right. All right. So <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying he knew that cue. Oh, that's Quaaludes, Rick. Okay. Uh, S. Sex, sex, and more sex. Okay. T. Travel and television. Okay, uh, you unavailable people, V, video games. Uh, that's, a, that's a medication. Uh, work, for W, excitement, uh, 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 yes pleasing people, and a Z, all the other habits, hurts, and hang ups. <laughs> okay, so uh, the world just keeps inventing new ways to put a band aid on your pain. But when we try to avoid pain, it always leads us down the path to losing our, our birthright. Now, the second cause of our self-defeating behavior is our unwillingness to delay gratification. I want pleasure, and I want it now, and I want it right now. I want it now, I want it all, I want it now, okay? And, and people say, I can't wait, I've gotta have it now, no matter what I feel. This is why you're in debt. You buy things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't even like. <laughs> and, and, you know, last year, uh, the average American spent about 2% more than they made. That's called going the wrong direction. Why? Because I gotta have it now, even if I have to charge it. You don't have the ability to wait. Wait until you got the money to buy it. No, no, I gotta have it now. And, and we are charging in every area of our lives. There are things in your life that need to be managed. Power needs to be managed, sex needs to be managed, your words need to be managed. Um, your energy needs to be managed, and, and when we don't manage it, well, then we go after these short-term pain. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 25, that Moses chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Now, I want you to circle the phrase, pleasures of sin. The Bible says sin is fun. 
Says it right there. He chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Sin is fun. If sin was painful, nobody do it. Okay, so let's just admit it. There's pleasure in sin. The Bible even says it. But it says, notice the next phrase, for a season, for a short time. You can have your kicks, but you're going to have the kickbacks. Okay, you, you can get high, but you're going you're gonna to have the, the, the hangover. Um, and so uh, maturity is the ability to deny yourself temporary le- illegitimate pleasure and wait for a greater legitimate pleasure in the future. What happens here is when we're trying to avoid pain, we're trying to get, ple- get pleasure right now, not wait for it legitimately, is we get impulsive. The Bible says of this in Proverbs 20, 25. All, an impulsive vow is a trap. And later, you wish you could get out of it. Okay, I want you to write this on your outline. This is a, a, a Warren principle. It's always easier to get in than to get out. That's what that verse teaches, okay? An impulsive vow is a trap. Later you'll wish you could get out of it. It's always easier to get in than it is to get out. Is it easier to get in debt than out of debt? Anybody wanna agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is it easier to get into a bad relationship than to get out of a bad relationship? Oh baby, oh baby, oh baby, all right? Is it easier to get unhealthy than it is to get unhealthy? I mean, get unhealthy than it is to get healthy. Yeah, yeah, it is, all right? Hey, let me put it another way. Is it easier to fill your schedule than to fulfill your schedule? Hello? Yeah, it's always easier to get in than to get out. Is it easier to start an addiction than to break it? Hello? It's always easier to get in than to get out. Now the Bible always warns us to not make impulsive decisions without considering the impact, the unintended consequences. Here's a good verse on it, Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. I love this in the message paraphrase. Watch out for the Esau syndrome. Circle that phrase there, because we're gonna come back to this. We're gonna spend a little time on it. Watch out for the Esau syndrome. Trading away God's lifelong gift that's your birthright, in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act. And he wanted to inherit God's blessing, but by then it was too late, even though he wept bitter tears. Now I want you to circle the phrase, bitter tears. I just want to be honest with you. As a pastor who's dealt with tens of thousands of people, you know what I've discovered? Tears are not enough to change you. I have sat in small groups, support groups. I have counseled people who were a bucket of tears and they're weeping over their shame and their sorrow for what they've done and they have no intention of changing. Tears are not enough. Some people think, oh, they're crying. They're they're, they're really repenting. No, they're just being sorry. Big difference. You know what I've discovered? Is that you can be crying and still be lying. (laughs) And you can have somebody sitting in a group going, oh, I just hate, I fell again, I fell again, and they're crying and they're crying and crying. They have no intention of changing. They're crying and they're lying at the same time. Because tears are not enough. It says here that, that Esau wept over the dumb decision he made, but it, it didn't change anything. And you have somebody just crying, crying, something. I would never do that to you. And they did, and they'd do it again. They can be crying and lying at the same time. Now, I wanna pause here and look at Esau for just a minute uh, because the details of this story are very relevant because our whole culture has fallen into the attitude of Esau or what the message paraphrase calls the Esau syndrome. Now here's the background. God came to Abraham and said to Abraham, "Uh, I'm gonna bless you like I've never blessed anybody in the entire world or will ever bless anybody in the entire world. I'm gonna make you a great nation. And out of your family will come the 10 commandments and the law of God 
and the Bible and the Messiah and everybody's gonna be blessed because of your family. God made this birthright promise to Abraham and to nobody else, okay? So this is a big birthright. You're gonna be a great nation. Abraham has a son named Isaac and the birthright's passed on. Now Isaac is gonna be that person. Isaac has twins, he has two boys, Esau and Jacob. Now Esau is the firstborn son and uh, he, he comes out of his mommy first, Rebecca, and, uh, and so he should get the birthright by law, by God's law. But uh, Jacob comes out and there's a fight for this birthright for the rest of their lives and he actually cheats his, his, his brother out. It. Second born is Jacob. Now, throughout the Bible, we read this phrase, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. What's the problem with this? It wasn't supposed to be Jacob. It was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac and Esau, I, Abraham, Isaac and Esau. He was the guy who got the birthright. He was the firstborn child. He was the rightful heir. And this is the most significant birthright in history. If you think about this, Israel today could have been named Esau. It could be the nation of Esau. Jacob uh, later, God later got the birthright and later be, uh, uh, God changed his name to Israel and so it's called Israel today. But originally it was supposed to be Esau who gets the birthright. So it should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac and Esau. So what happened? How did he miss all that God had planned for his life. He foolishly gave up his birthright. I want you to see how and why he did it so you don't. And so you can help other people uh, not make this mistake too. Genesis 25, verses 24 to 34 gives us uh, all of the verses. And I didn't have room to put them on your outline, so they're here on the screen. The Bible says this. Um, first, that the competition between these t twins actually started in the womb. It says, when Rebecca gave birth to twins, the first baby to come out was covered with red hair, so they named him Esau. Um, when the second baby came out, he was grabbing onto his brother's heel. So they named him Jacob, which uh, there's some debate on this, but the word Jacob probably means supplanter or it means schemer. Schemer, okay, the guy's hanging, okay, you're not getting out first. <laughs> I'm gonna be the first one out, okay. And so there's already competition between the tents. Now, as they grew up, uh, the boys became the exact opposite. Here's what the Bible says. And as the twins grew older, Esau loved the outdoors and became a hunter, but Jacob was a quiet man who liked to stay indoors. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We all just have different kinds of personality. But the bad part of it was dysfunctional family, it caused the mom and dad to each choose favorites. Is that ever a good idea? No. Does that cause a lot of pain? Yeah. And, and do we try to avoid pain? Yes. And does it cause need for recovery? Yes. Okay. So here's, here's what the Bible says. Now Isaac, lo Isaac, that's the dad, loved Esau the most, but Rebekah loved Jacob the most. And the reason Esau was his dad's favorite was because he often brought home wild game that his dad loved to eat. Oh, good job, dad, okay? <laughs> I love the one who brings me steaks, okay? That, that's good, that's a really legitimate reason to, uh, to mess up your whole family, okay? Thank you. Now, here's what the Bible says. One day, uh, when Jacob was cooking some stew, he's a homebody, uh, Esau came home from hunting, exhausted and starving. Now I wanna pause right here. Okay, when you get exhausted, and when you get hungry, you're being set up for temptation. You need to make sure you don't get exhausted, you don't get hungry, okay? Your blood sugar's low, you're gonna make some bad decisions. Uh, exhausted and hungry, when you are at a weak point, Satan is setting you up to steal your birthright. Okay, so Esau came home from hunting, exhausted and starving. He smelled Jacob's stew. Oh man, that smells good. And he said, I've got to have some of that right now. That's inability to delay gratification. I gotta have it right now. I can't wait. Inability to grab 
delay. I got to have sex now. I got to have drugs now. I got to have this now. I've got to have it right now. I can't wait. I'm about to collapse. Just give me a little bit to keep me from dying. You hear his voice, keep me from dying. Man, I'm, I'm begging you, please, I'm down on my knees. You know, uh, okay, keep me from dying. Okay, now, <laughs> notice the setup for this temptation because Satan uses this on you, he just doesn't use it with stew. Okay, all right. He might tempt me with stew, but probably not you. Okay, now. Number one, when you're worn out and you're low on willpower, you're in a weakened state. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and uh, you have a normal need to eat uh, that is unmet here. And you have normal drives in your life that there's nothing wrong with those drives. There's nothing wrong with the sex drive. There's nothing wrong with the eating drive. There's nothing wrong with the drive to sleep. There's nothing wrong with the drive to want to be loved and respected. There's nothing wrong with that. Satan always takes legitimate drives and pushes them to an extreme and says you're going to do it now in an illegitimate way. And what happens is you get in a hurry to meet your own need. And you don't wait on God. And you don't wait for God to provide. I can't wait. I'm dying out here. You know how long it's been since I've had sex? You know how long it's been since I had somebody hug me? You know how long? And on and on and on. And here's the big issue. You exaggerate your discomfort and pain. I'm dying. No, you're not. You're just hungry. <laughs> you, you, you haven't gone 30 days without food, 40 days without food. You've gone a day without food. You probably had breakfast before you went out to go hunting. He's not dying. <laughs> He's not, in any sense of the word, dying. But how many times have you used as an excuse to do something wrong to take matters in your own hands and say, I'm dying. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do what's best for me. And, uh, and, and so um, this is going on. Now here's what Jacob uh, does. Jacob thought about it. And he came up with a bargain. He said, okay, here's the deal. Uh, I'll trade you my delicious, notice, delicious, Hot stew, it's delicious, it's hot, it's homemade. You can smell it, baby. Uh, uh, and I'll trade you my delicious hot stew if you'll trade me your natural birthright. Seem fair? Uh, no, no. Now, what's your birthright? That's the rights you naturally inherit because you were the firstborn. Now, here's what Esau says. This is the dumbest line in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> e Esau says, done, done deal, great, done deal, fine, you can have my birthright. I mean, what good are these future rights if I die of starvation now? <laughs> yeah, you're right, okay. He goes, my birthright isn't helping me at this moment. I'm hungry. And if I'm dead, oh, I love this logic, if I'm dead, all of my father's wealth won't be worthless to me anyway. So, done deal, go ahead, it's done. And um, now, let me pause here for a minute, because I don't preach this the way most preachers preach it. Most preachers and most people uh, give Jacob too much credit for craftiness. They think he, you know, he sneaked in and was crafty and wily and scheming and he wanted that birthright and so he cooked up this big plan. Uh, no, this is not crafty, friends. I mean, how about if this, if I said to you, um, hey, what's your name right there? Yeah. Can't read it. Uh, Michael, okay, great. Okay, if I said, okay, Michael, um, I'll tell you what. I'll give you this cup of water and you give me your car and home. <laughs> okay, uh, that's not a trick. That's not a tactic. That's not a strategy. It just means if Michael does it, he's stupid. <laughs> okay, so, so it's not that Jacob was really smart, it's that Esau was the dumbest man on the planet. 
I'll give you a cup of water and you're gonna give me your car and your home and your future and your birth. That's just, that is stupid, okay? You can't fix stupid, all right? Now, all right. Now, if you told this story to anybody, hey, uh, I, there was two brothers, one of them said, look, I'll give you a bowl of soup and you give me your entire future inheritance. Nobody would say, oh, that's a wise deal. <laughs> they, would, uh, they wouldn't even think that Jacob was smart. They would just think Esau was really dumb. Okay, so it, it wasn't Jacob sneaky, it's that Esau's stupid. Uh, he doesn't care about uh, a future pain, he only cares about pleasure now. I want it and I want it now. Is this vaguely hitting any buttons in your life? Okay. <laughs> because a lot of the problems in your life is you wanted to have the pleasure now, I gotta get rid of the pain and I gotta get the pleasure now. And, and so uh, Esau here makes an irreversible choice based on an irresistible emotion. He put his feelings before his future. This is why we all need recovery because we've all done this. We put our feelings before our future. He chooses short-term pleasure over long-term profit. You know anybody like that? Just the whole world. We may have not done it this blatantly, but every one of us have done this. There are even phrases in our culture, if it feels good, do it, yeah. Doesn't matter what happens in the future, doesn't matter what the payoff is, I gotta do what's best for me, you know. You look out for number one. And the result of this simple choosing feelings over his future, he gives away his identity, his inheritance, um, his dignity, and his destiny. Now let me just give you a little advice here as a pastor who loves you. When you are tempted to be manipulated by your moods, and listen to a feeling instead of looking at the future. Uh, whenever you're manipulated by a mood, you need to tell yourself this phrase, write it, write it down. This feeling won't last. You need to write that down. You need to memorize it and say it over. This feeling won't last. Because no emotion ever lasts. By their very nature, emotions are temporary. They cannot last. You can't stay angry forever and ever and ever, because it's built on adrenaline. You run out of adrenaline instantly. Uh, you, you can't stay depressed forever and ever and ever. You, you're gonna, at some point, it'll lift a little bit. Every emotion is temporary, and when you're tempted to be manipulated by moves to say this feeling won't last, it's, it's temporary. What I'm saying is this. Uh, you may feel lonely, but it's not gonna last. So don't make a dumb decision in your loneliness. Uh, you may feel afraid, but it's not going to last. So don't make a dumb decision when you're afraid. You may feel aroused, but it's not going to last. Don't make a dumb decision when you're aroused. Uh, you, you may feel uh, discouraged, but you're not always going to feel discouraged. It's not going to last. You may feel like a failure. You're not always going to feel that. No feeling lasts forever. And what I'm telling you and trying to teach you on this is, so you don't lose all that God has for you in, in your life, is your hunger will pass. And it's not gonna be your last opportunity to eat. Uh, your loneliness will pass. And it's not gonna be your last opportunity to find somebody. If I don't go to bed with this person, ooh, man. Um, your frustration will pass. But it's not gonna be the last time you find a solution. You just need to realize, if I'm feeling it, it is by nature temporary. And instead of obeying my feelings, I should test my feelings, write that down. Instead of obeying my feelings, I should test my feelings. When I'm in that Esau moment, and I'm tempted to throw away something, okay, this is, What's going on here? You should test your feelings. Now, Jacob evidently is smart enough to know this, and he knows that, that Esau's later, his feelings are gonna change. What he's feeling right now, it's not gonna stay. 
So Jacob tries to make this a permanent decision. And here's what the Bible says. Look up here on the screen. But Jacob wanted to lock him in. Pause. Satan wants to lock you in with a temporary emotion. Jacob wanted to lock him in because he knew this emotion wasn't going to last. I'm dying. I got to have something food right now. So he said, first, before I give you my delicious stew, first, you must vow. There's a vow. Remember, it's don't make an impulsive vow. It's always easier to get in than to get out. First, you must vow that you're giving up your birthrights to me in exchange for my stew. So, dumb Esau, <laughs> that's in the Greek, <laughs> or, uh, 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 swore a, actually in Hebrew because it's in Genesis, Esau swore a binding oath to Jacob. Now after that, Jacob gave Esau a big bowl of stew and some bread. Oh, we got added value here. Now we're getting bread too thrown in. Isn't that great? Esau's going, not only do I get the stew, I get bread. Woohoo! Yeah, man, I didn't even ask for bread. He gave me a big bowl and some stew. J Esau is dumb, man. He's just dumb. He's as dumb as a rock. Okay? So Esau swore a binding oath. Jacob gave Esau a big bowl of stew and some bread. And when Esau had finished eating, notice it, he got up and went back to his business. He was indifferent to what he had just done. Is that not the saddest thing you've ever seen? And people are selling their birthright by the second in our culture. Selling it out to whatever happens to catch their fancy. It may be a drug, it may be a codependent person that they're connected to, it, 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 it could be any, anything. We know that there's a thousand ways to make stew. And Satan knows your favorite flavor. So, so, you know, he is, here's, Esau should have remembered Proverbs 20, 25. Of course, it hadn't been written yet, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's always easier to get in than it is to, to get out. Now, here's the lesson. Never make a permanent decision on a temporary feeling. Never make a permanent decision about your life like give up my birthright, sell out my marriage, leave my career, quit a church, or what. never make a, a permanent decision based on a temporary um, emotion, a temporary feeling. And never sacrifice long-term blessing for short-term relief. I'm dying, I gotta have something to eat right now. Let me say it another way. Never give up the next 40 years for the next 40 minutes. Am I getting anywhere with this? Okay. All right. So never give up the next 40 years for the next 40 minutes. Let me show you a verse on the screen. Galatians 6, 8. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. Here's the point. God has given you the freedom to choose. And you can choose whatever you want. And God's not going to stop you. You can make bad choices. You can make good ones or bad ones. You are free to make any choice you want to make in life, but you are not free the moment you make that choice. You're no longer free because you're free to make the choice, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. Those are going to happen whether you like it or not. So you need to think, well, I'm free. I'm free to make this choice. You are, but you are not free from the consequences of it the moment it happens. And every one of us could give a testimony on that one. All right. Now that's the bad news. Let's get to the good news. Point number six I want to make is this. Jesus came to recover my God-given birthrights. The ones that got stolen by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The ones that I stupidly gave up or sold out. Jesus came to recover my God-given birthrights. Integrity, uh, or dignity, and uh, identity, and heredity, and, and, and destiny. Uh, Jesus does not leave us to save ourselves. He sent a savior. I love this verse, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. God sent his son to redeem us. So we've been set free to experience our rightful heritage. Isn't that beautiful? 
What, what God said, you have a right to this, and you gave it away. And the NIV of this verse, Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this, that we might receive the full rights of his children. If you're a child of God, you have rights. You're a child of the king, you have rights. When I was a teenager, Joni Mitchell wrote a song about Woodstock. Some of you remember the song, and in, the, in that song about Woodstock, she says, we are stardust, we are golden, and we're caught in the devil's bargain, and we gotta get ourselves back to the garden. Now, if you read the music, the word garden is a capital G. She's talking about the Garden of Eden. It says we've lost our innocence. We are stardust, we are golden, we're caught in the devil's bargain, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden where it all started, Adam and Eve. Here's the problem, you can't do it, and neither can I. I can't get back there, and you can't either. We need a savior. We need a restorer. We need a rescuer, we need a recoverer. We need a savior. And ever since man's fall in the Garden of Eden, Jesus has been on a rescue and recovery mission. Jesus is all about recovery. Luke 19, 10. I've come to seek and to save that which is what? Lost, lost. I, I, I'm, I'm on a recovery mission. I'm gonna recover that which you lost from all of the bad decisions. Now I, want, I just pause here and I'm gonna encourage everybody who's watching this right now or listening right here, do a Bible study on these words, repair, restore, renew, re, uh, refresh, recover, bring back. These are all recovery terms and they're all through the Bible. In 2017, Saddleback is going to lead hopefully thousands, maybe tens of thousands of churches in what we're calling the year of hope. And we're going to look at every one of these words in detail, repair, restore, recover, renew, refresh, bring back. How do I renew my life? How do I renew my marriage? How do I renew my church? How do I recover what God says is rightfully mine? I invite your church to join us in the year of hope. We're gonna start in January, it'll be 12 months. We're gonna look at personal renewal, and we're gonna look at relational renewal, and we're gonna talk at missional church renewal, and we're gonna talk about renewal in the, in the country, in, in, in the nation. Now, let me just pause here and say this. The key to overcoming any habitual area of failure, where you just keep giving in, and you go back and get another bowl of stew. You just keep going back, man, that was good. I, I know I gave up my birthright to get it, but it was good. And, and so I'm gonna go back, it was good. Okay, here's what you need to do. You need to switch your focus from the taste of the stew to the benefits of the birthright. You need to stop looking at the short-term pleasure and you need to look at the long-term gain for eternity. Remember, that's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the key. You switch your mind. We're gonna come, there's a word for this. Switching your mind from focusing on the short-term pleasure to focusing on the long-term you know, benefit that God has for me, all right? Uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he will give you that strength to switch your focus, to change your mind. Now, number seven. Uh, that's what Jesus came to do, help us recover. Number seven is, once we're recovering, here it is, we are to help others recover. We are to help others recover. In fact, helping others recover is part of my own recovery. The Bible tells us that God restored and recovered all that Job had lost in his painful years. Not when he prayed for himself, but when he prayed for his friends. It says in the end of the book of Job, everything had gone wrong in his life. He lost everything, all his wealth, all his family, uh, lost his health. The only thing that was left was, was a nagging wife. He goes, oh, thank you, God. And she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Thanks, honey, that's good advice, really good. Thank you, babe, all right? And, 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 and in his life, in his life, it says God reversed his fortunes, restored all that he's lost, twice as much what he'd lost, when he prayed, not for himself, for his friends. So we, we help others in their own recovery. Galatians 6.1, look on the screen here. Helping others, it says this. 
If any person is overtaken in a sin, any sort of sin, you who are spiritual should set him right and restore and reinstate him without any sense of superiority. This is a good verse for recovery. And with all gentleness, keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. So the Bible says, you see somebody going through a tough time, you help recover them, you help restore them, you help rescue them, and don't do it with a superior attitude. Hey, we're all in the same boat. Evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. I saw a perfect example of it this week. Some of you maybe have seen some of these headlines. It's been in all the papers. ESPN did a documentary on it. You can see on, a, on I was gonna show it, but we don't have time to show it. It says, Olympic swimmer star Michael Phelps says Rick Warren's purpose-driven life saved him from suicide. Now, I don't have the time to show you the 16-minute video, but let me just explain it to you. Michael Phelps, the most winningest gold medal person in history. Nobody has won more at the Olympics than Michael Phelps. He had 18 gold medals when he retired in 2012. When he retired in 2012, he had no more swimming to do. He lost the meaning of his life because he had nothing more than, than swimming. He got depressed. He got bored. He started partying. He started drinking. He started doing drugs. He got arrested for drunk driving. He got to the point, and he says this in the ESPN. You can watch it on, on, uh, online. He said, I, I got to the point, I thought, maybe it would be better if I just took my own life. The most decorated Olympic athlete in history. He said, I, I was suicidal. I was ready to take my life. Fortunately, he had a friend who was willing to help others recover. Somebody who had been through it himself, the world famous NFL star, Ray Lewis. Okay. Okay. Ray Lewis had his own set of problems. Ray Lewis was even at one point up for uh, a murder charge, which he was cleared of, but all kinds of bad things happened, and he ended up having like six kids with three different women, and, 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 he, and, and the big thing with Ray, if you go back to the 2006 cover issue of Sports Illustration, called The Gospel According to, to Ray Lewis, and he says there, I had no father in my life, and every time I wanted him in my life, he, he, ne he never, I said he left the day I was born, and the only time I'd need him was when he would want money, and then he would make promises, and never, never showed up. He said one time he even said, I've been kicked out by my girlfriend in Florida. Can you come down and get me? Ray goes down to get him, and his dad had left him there. And he said, I can count the number of times that my mom said, your dad's coming to pick you up today, and I'd make my little sack and sit out on the, on the stairs and wait for him all day, and then he'd never come. And I'd sit there and cry myself. And he said, I had a good mom, but my mom couldn't teach me how to be a man. I didn't know how to be a man. And he got into all kinds of problems. But he found a good believer named Chuck Singletary, uh, I mean, I mean uh, who had been, you know, an athlete and, and uh, with Chicago Bears. And uh, Mike Singletary, not Chuck, Mike Singletary. And, and, and anyway, Ray got a copy of Purpose Driven Life. I talked to Ray yesterday on the phone. Uh, we were talking on the phone. He said, Rick, I read the book through seven times. So not once, not twice. I read it through seven times. And he said, it changed my life. So when my friend Michael Phelps was suicidal, I said, Mike, I mean, Michael Phelps said, you got to do two things. One, we're going to check you in to an inpatient recovery clinic in, in, in uh, Arizona, and you're going to read Warren's book. And so he started reading. This is all in the documentary. It shows pictures of the book and everything like that. And um, Phelps, it blew his mind. And he, it opened his heart to Christ. And his life was turned around so much that he began reading the book to everybody else at the clinic. <laughs> and, and they changed his name to Preacher Mike. Okay. And out, out of that, out of that, he decided, well, maybe I could go to a fifth Olympic. Maybe God does have a purpose and plan for my life. And his life was turned around. You know he's back at the Olympics right now. He's won three more goals just in the last few days. And it, n nobody even comes close. Now, I I I'm not here to talk about Michael. What I'm here to talk about is Ray. 
Ray saved Michael's life by getting him into recovery. Ray saved Michael's life by getting him purpose-driven life. So we're to help others recover. Um, and, and, and we're to help everybody. And by the way, since we're here, this is my challenge to everybody at Saddleback Church. And this is my challenge to every church who's a part of the Celebrate Recovery family uh, is this. Let's take this message, not just to America, but to the whole world. To the whole, whole world. One day, Isaiah started having a pity party. And the Bible tells us his story uh, in the book of Isaiah. He records it in Isaiah chapter 49. And he says in this conversation with God, God, I know you've called me to serve you, and I know you've gifted me, and I know I've been true to you, but I feel like my ministry has been in vain and to no purpose. He uses the phrase, I've lived and served to no purpose. I'm not purpose driven. I don't know what the purpose of my life is. He's having a pity party. God doesn't say, well, here, have some warm cookies and milk. <laughs> he said, you know, Ray, what your, uh, he said, you know what, Isaiah, your problem is? He says, you're not thinking big enough. His antidote to his depression and discouragement was, your eyes are too small. And he says, I didn't call you just to win your nation to Christ. I called you to care about the whole world. Look at this verse on the screen. God said to Isaiah, it's not a big enough job for my servant to just recover. There's the word recovery. It's not a big enough job for my servant just to recover the tribes of Jacob. That's your own people, the Israelites. I'm setting you up as a light for the nation so that my salvation goes global. Goes global. That's what God wants to do. All right, one last thing, and we'll wrap this up. And, and I do want you to join us in the global glory of God, taking the message of peace, the message of purpose, the message of recovery all around the world. Number eight, one day our recovery will be completed. One day our recovery is going to be completely, completely, completely completed. You're not going to stay broke for the rest of eternity. Hallelujah. Okay. And the Bible says you're not going to stay with broken emotions, broken relationships, broken body, broken mind, broken spirit, broken heart. You're not going to stay broken. The Bible says this is how it's going to happen. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Tells us how to do it and then the results. A repent and turn to God. Repent and turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. I like that. Then wonderful times of refreshment will come. I like that. Wonderful times of refreshment will come in your life from the presence of the Lord. And he will send Jesus to you again. He's talking about the second coming of Christ right here. He will send Jesus to you again. Jesus is going to come back one day. He says, but right now, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago. One day there's gonna be the final restoration of all things. There's gonna be the recovery of all things, the renewal, the repairing, the restoration, the recovery of all things God created. Now notice the condition for this to happen. Circle the first word. Repent. Repent and turn to God. Now, most people don't know the meaning of the word repent. When I say repent, most of you think of a guy standing on a street corner with a sign saying, repent, turn or burn, you're going to die and fry while we go to the sky. <laughs> and if you ask the average person on the street what repentance means, it means stop all your evil, wicked, mean, bad, and nasty stuff. That is not what repentance means. Repentance does not have anything to do with behavior. It doesn't mean you stop doing bad. It does not mean that. There's not a single Greek or Hebrew lexicon in the world that says repentance means stop doing bad things. It, do it doesn't mean that. What does repentance mean? The word in Greek is metanoia. Noia is the word for mind, nous. Meta means to change. Metanoia means to change your mind. 
that's repentance. I stop looking at darkness and I look to light. I make a 180 degree change in my thinking. It has nothing to do with your behavior. Your behavior will follow. It's all about changing your mind. And the definition of repentance is the decision and the process of changing your mind. At Saddleback and in CR, we call that recovery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> repentance is recovery and recovery is repentance. The decision and process of changing your mind. Now let me give you an illustration to it and we'll close. Anybody who's ever worked on a computer probably knows what Microsoft Word is, right? Okay, the word processing problem. Any word processing program, when you're typing, you know, it sets what's called a default. And it, has a, it chooses the size and the font and the color that you're going to type with. That's called the default settings. Now, if you want to change the font or change the size or change the color, you can do that. It lets you do that. And you can make the change and you can change it for a paragraph or a page or whatever. But it's only temporary change. It's only a temporary change. And, and so when you go back the next day and you open up the, the program again, it's going to go back to the default. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and so what happens is it automatically reverts back the next time you open a document. If you want to make a permanent change, you have to change the default. In theological terms, changing the default is called repentance. Metanoia, changing your mind. You have to change the way you think. You have to change the default settings. And all of a sudden, I've used this illustration before, but I want to use it again. It's if you've got a boat and it has an automatic pilot in it and you're going across the lake and the automatic pilot says, go north then you're, it's gonna head north because the autopilot, the default setting is to go north. Now, the, if you want to change the boat's direction and you wanna go south, you wanna make a 180 degree turn, you want to repent, you got two options. One of them is by sheer willpower, grab onto the handle of the wheel of this boat that's set automatically to go north and force it to go south. And you're going south. And the whole time, it's, go, it's not going south but you're under tension because the boat naturally wants to go that way. And you're forcing it by sheer willpower to go this way. And you know what? The whole time your arms are under stress because it wants to go that way. And, and pretty soon you get tired because you're tired of holding on. Willpower doesn't work long term. It's why willpower works great for a diet for three weeks. Then you get tired of willpower. And what happens is you let go of the wheel and you start eating again. Junk food. You, you, you're forcing it. I'm not going to do this. And you let go and you start drinking again. You start smoking again. You start going back to, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, sexual addictions or whatever kinds of problems in your life. You go back to the same way because you haven't changed the default. The easier way to change your life is to change the automatic pilot. When you change the automatic pilot, it's no stress at all. It just naturally goes that direction. You're not under tension because you're not forcing it to go against its nature. Does this make sense? What is your automatic pilot? Complete this sentence 10 times, I'll tell me your automatic pilot. It's just like me to be. Uh, okay. If you say that phrase 10 times and finish it, I'll know what your automatic pilot is. It's just like me to be lazy. It's just like me to be uh, critical. It's just like me uh, to be late. It's just like me to be, and, and you have programmed yourself. You need to repent. Metanoia. Change your mind. This is a decision followed by the process. And the 12 steps and the eight principles of recovery are literally baby steps of repentance. The whole thing from step one to step 12 is repentance. The whole thing of the eight beatitudes, the principles from one to eight is repentance. Celebrate recovery is the life of repentance. 
It's the life of changing your mind. It's a decision followed by a process. And the longer you go, your, your, your default changes. And now you've got a new normal. A new normal. Does that make sense? Now, let me, let me be clear on this. When you change your autopilot, you get a new normal. Repentance changes the way you think. And, and during the year of hope, we're gonna spend an entire time on how to change the way you think. So you don't wanna miss that. But you change the way you think. You're, the new normal is, I naturally go this way. Does it mean you're never gonna stumble or fall? No, no, you're gonna stumble or fall. You, you'll, you'll have those stumbles. Relapse is part of recovery. But it's not your default anymore. Okay, it's not your default. You may have a stumble here. Oh yeah, no, no, but quick, look, that's not me. And you go back this way. Okay, it, you, it, the new normal is this way. The default has changed in your life. That's repentance and that's recovery. And that's how you get the birthrights of God in your life. Let's bow for prayer. I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. You don't have to pray it aloud. God knows your thoughts. The first thing I said to you is that everybody needs recovery. So it starts with an admission. And wherever you are listening to this right now, I want you to just say to God in your heart, God, I need recovery. You can say it in your mind, not say it aloud. God, I need recovery. All have sinned. All have strayed away. We've all wandered off God's path to go our own way, do our own thing. And the problem is it's cut me off from God. I'm estranged. Say, so God, I admit I, I have sinned. I, I admit that I've been my own God. And then say, God, th this has caused a disconnection from you. And I haven't always felt close to you. And it has blurred my birthrights, blur, blurred them. I, 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 I don't know who am I, my identity. I don't know where did I come from, where did I belong to, my heredity. I, 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 I don't always know my dignity. Does my life matter? What's my purpose? I don't know my destiny. What, where am I headed? I now understand because of today that, that I have two birthrights, the ones from my parents, my natural, and the ones from you, the spiritual the priceless inheritance you've laid up for your children. And Lord, I realize today that Satan wants to keep me from enjoying all the blessings that are rightfully mine as a child of God. Help me to be aware when I'm avoiding pain instead of dealing with the problem. And help me be aware when I'm settling and selling out for short-term pleasure instead of looking at the long-term future. I don't wanna sell out like Esau did. Help me to remember it's always easier to get in than to get out. Jesus Christ, thank you for coming to recover my God-given birthrights, that you came to seek and save that which is lost, and that's me. And I ask you to help me to recover what you have given to me what's rightfully mine as your child. And then I want you to help me recover others to restore and restate without, reinstate without any sense of superiority. Lord, I thank you for the hope. As we go to the year of hope this next year, I thank you for the hope of the wonderful times of refreshment that will come and even eventually the final restoration of all things. Thank you, God, that I'm not going to be broken for all of eternity. And so today I start the decision and the process of changing my mind by filling it with your word. I repent. I want to work the steps of recovery, these biblical principles of repentance. And I ask you to give me the power that I don't have Lord, I pray for every person who just prayed this prayer that you'll give them the wisdom to get in your word every day, uh, the power to get in a small group, to be in community, to be better together, to not try to do this on their own, 
and that we would not just depend on you and not just depend on each other, but we would depend on both and we would depend on your word and your promises. I ask you to start a mighty movement of people who have recovered from their habits and their hurts and their hangups that goes not just national but international and global so that your salvation goes global. And I humbly pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.